Good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2023. I can't see my witnesses online, is there? Oh, oh. Okay, good morning. Um, I'm uh, now seeing our guests um, who are joining us online, so thank you for that. Um, Good morning and welcome. And our first agenda item is a decision to take business in private. Are members content to take agenda item three in private? Thank you. Uh, agenda item two is our inquiry into how devolution is changing post EU. Um, and we continue to get evidence on our inquiry. And Inquiring into how devolution should evolve to respond to the challenges and opportunities of a new constitutional landscape. We are joined virtually this morning by our colleague Mark Gruskell and our panel this morning is Professor Nicola McEwen, Professor of Territorial Politics at the University of Edinburgh, Akash Pond, Senior Fellow, Institute of Government, and Professor John Denham, Prof Professorial Research Fellow in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Southampton and Director of the Centre for English Identity and Politics. Um, and a warm welcome to you all. Um, we have also received apologies from Professor Jo Hunt, Professor of in Law at Cardiff University. Um, if I could um, perhaps open um, with um, an, over the past few months our inquiry works have identified fundamental concerns which need to be addressed in relation to how devolution is working post uh, exit from Europe by the UK. Um, we have seen tensions around the civil conventions about balance of power and where decision making now lies and scrutiny. Um, and I wonder if I could just ask a general question about um, your observations around these areas. And if I could begin, please, with Professor McEwen. Morning. Thanks very much for the invitation to come along. Um, I mean, it, it, it feels to me that devolution may be at a turning point, although as with all historical turning points, you don't really know them until until much later and much further down the line. Um, but I mean, there were already changes afoot um, before Brexit came along with the new devolution settlement, making things a lot more complex, a lot more interdependent in terms of the split between devolved and reserved powers. So that was already in train. Um, but Brexit clearly exacerbated that, um, creating a, a a completely new uh, constitutional landscape within which devolution uh, was framed. Um, we've seen a, a variety of, of legislative and intergovernmental processes to try to adapt to um, moving the UK um, away from the EU regulatory umbrella. Some of those have been where governments have worked together, some of those where they've been in competition. And I think we're also seeing um, competitive nationalisms in place uh, now. UK government flexing its muscle, perhaps, for a variety of reasons, pushing back at the boundaries of devolution um, from, um, from the outside, um, as the British government has sometimes pushed uh, to extend those boundaries from the inside. So I think all of those together, the cumulative effect of that suggests to me that, that we are at some sort of turning point. Thank you, Professor McEwen. Can I bring in Akash Pon, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, and, and good morning and well, thanks for the invitation to take part in this. I was hoping to be with you in Edinburgh, but I'm afraid the, the train strike uh, put paid to that. But happy I can take part virtually. Um, I, I, I would agree with a lot of what um, Nicola has just said. I think um, a lot of aspects of devolution and the territorial constitution um, have, I think, been put into a, a, a degree of uncertainty. Things do feel in flux in, in various respects. Um, I think the, the specific points I would highlight um, are, first of all, I think um, what we've seen is post-Brexit, to some extent, as part of the wider 
um, UK government narrative around taking back control to Westminster and so on, um, which obviously initially in, its, in, in the phrase take back control was about, was about Brexit itself and taking back power from, from Brussels. But that, I think, has, is, has, has been part of a wider um, constitutional perspective that uh, many people, I think, in the current government at Westminster hold um, that is rooted in a sort of traditional view of parliamentary sovereignty and has led to this greater willingness to, um, to, to take back powers from other institutions to, to, to for example, um, in, uh, the, the, in terms of relationship between Westminster and the courts, but also very much in terms of the relationship between Westminster and, and the devolved institutions, um, and, and, and hence um, the, the willingness that we've seen to legislate without consent um, on a number of occasions um, was is something that you know was was largely um, unknown prior to 2016 and and the Sewell Convention yes was always a convention was always known to be or it's assumed to be legally unenforceable but it was I think taken to be a much more binding political uh, rule that that governments would would abide by then um, it, it now is um, it now has been revealed to be. So that's, I think, one big area. So this whole question of how devolution can be protected um, or potentially entrenched, I think, is a, is a big area of debate. Um, and then I think also, as, as Nicola has, has already alluded to, um, I think because of the withdrawal of um, EU law, um, we've been, we were left with this big zone of, of, of regulatory um, uncertainty, and that's created a new need for uh, for greater cooperation between the governments, for new institutions, and a new culture, frankly, of of shared governance. And I think the the UK, the UK as a whole, and the UK government in particular, is sort of stumbling towards um, a new set of uh, approaches for for dealing with these issues. So I think those are probably the two big issues. Um, I mean, there's others as well. I think the, the relationship between executive and legislative power, um, which is an issue I know the government, the, the committee has taken an interest in, um, that has been destabilised somewhat, and there's been a, a growing reliance on, you know, delegated powers and 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 so on. So that raises issues of of scrutiny, and then I'm sure John. Denham will, will be speaking about the, the place of England within the union, which I think to some extent Brexit has also shone a, a, a spotlight on uh, to a greater extent than, than, than uh, previously. But yeah, there's, there's a big set of issues obviously that you're addressing in, the, in this inquiry. So I look forward to diving into some of those in more detail. Thank you very much, Mr. Pohn. Um, can I bring in Professor John Denham, please? Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and somebody who's work is spent largely thinking about the politics of England and the governance of England and England's position within the Union. It's a privilege to take part in this session, so thank you very much. I, I would make two broad points. Brexit ought to make us consider that the United Kingdom that joined the common market in the 1970s was entirely different to the United Kingdom that left the EU in 2020. The role of the state changed. Uh, we obviously had national devolution. British politics fought across the island of Britain was replaced much more clearly by different national political configurations. Just before the common market decision, Kilbrandon was worried about England being too dominant within the union. Now we have a government of the UK with a majority that relies almost entirely on England, 156 majority, giving us a UK majority of 80. And as Akash has mentioned, our ideas of parliamentary sovereignty have changed, not just in relation to uh, the nations, but also to the role of referenda and, for example, the current EU legislation, the extent to which parliamentary sovereignty is now seen as an enabler of executive power in a way that would have been inconceivable even when I was an MP back in 2015. So all of those changes. The second thing I think we can say very clearly now is that if a United Kingdom government had attempted to do Scottish and Welsh devolution at the turn of the century, in a UK that was outside the EU, nobody would ever have heard of the Sewell Convention. 
The idea that the Sewell Convention would have been adequate to resolve these differences of competence is unbelievable. And of course, that's because we were in the EU, the vast areas of uh, potentially contested domestic policy were off the agenda. So Sewell obviously looked adequate, and it's not a surprise that it's since then that the problems have come to light. So I think the thought experiment, imagine you wanted to do devolution at the end of the, uh, the last century, and the pressures I'm sure would have been there to do that. We would have had to confront all of the issues about what a union might look like in the 21st century that had been pushed under the carpet. And I think where we are at the moment is a point where people are still very reluctant to have that debate about what a 21st century union might look like. So, for example, to take one example, and I'll stop at this point, but in the United Kingdom outside the European Union, the question of whether you can happily conflate the government of England with the government of the UK would have had to have been addressed explicitly because it is the source of many of the difficulties that we have at the moment. And from an English point of view, it's one of the reasons why England is so badly governed. I mean, there's issues for the union, but it's actually a, a problem for England itself. We would have had to confront those. And I suppose what I wanted to say to, to your very timely inquiry is we actually have to have that discussion about a union in the 21st century. And the idea that some adjustments to intra-governmental relations are going to resolve really quite fundamental problems seems to me to be all well, very optimistic in the extreme. Okay, thank you for that. I'm going to move to questions from committee members and can invite um, Mr Cameron first, please. Thank you. Thank you, convener, um, and welcome to the panel. Um, and if I could um, start with uh, Professor Denham, please, uh, just picking up on a, on a point that you've just made, um, and also to thank you for your submission. I mean, I do think it's something that we don't, in Scotland, think enough about, which is you know, the English aspect of, of devolution. Um, so it's a very welcome, um, welcome submission. Um, and I just um, was very struck by the comments you made about the fact that your belief that tensions within the union stem from the conflation of the government of England uh, and the government of the union, and that there's been a failure to delineate between the two. Um, and I just would like to ask you, particularly with, rela with relation to, uh, with regard to intergovernmental relations, which I think is, is, a, is a major part of what we're looking at, um, how would you um, what, what sort of system would you like to see in place, or what sort of system would be beneficial to try and um, mediate, uh, agree, etc., between the component parts of the union uh, in this day and age? I think. Th thank you very much for the question. I think what's important is to identify, is, is to actually separate out the governance structures of the UK and of England. So if we look at England, for example, there is no civil service structure that coordinates the development and implementation of policy in England. Uh, English governmental policies fragmented across union departments, some of which are England only, some of which are England and Wales, some of which are UK wide, but in an uncoordinated fashion. And in practice, the UK Treasury dictates much of English domestic policy, as we saw in the budget, as we saw in the budget yesterday. So the first step is to actually create a machinery of government for England, which focuses on how England's domestic policy is governed. And as you do that, I think you can then become more explicit about what is an issue for England and where are the union-wide areas of concern. And if you have a structure that do that, then when you talk about intergovernmental relations, certainly on issue, most issues of domestic policy, but also things probably like the internal market, you would explicitly identify the English issues and the union-wide issues. And where you can see there's an English issue which is distinct perhaps from a Scottish issue, you then should have a union structure which enables you to say, how are we going to negotiate the best resolution to this difference of interest? At the moment, that process doesn't take place. And this is not just about the formal structures of Whitehall. It's really about the mindset of ministers and the mindset of civil servants 
who do who even if their day job effectively is about delivery for England, imagine that that is the same as being a UK minister. And so it's that mindset they bring to it that sort of you govern as an English UK minister, and then what Wales or Scotland or Northern Ireland might want is a secondary consideration that you somehow have to build into your processes. Now, if you separated out the two, I, I think that would lead to better governance for England, but I think it would lead to a much more explicit discussion with the devolved nations and the devolved governments about potential conflicts of interest. Thank you for that. Can I, can I turn to the um, other panellists um, on, on the subject of intergovernmental relations and get their thoughts on you know, what sort of system should be in place, uh, how we improve it, etc. Nicola, could I turn to you first, please? Yeah, so I just want to follow up on, on John's contribution there, because I think that's really interesting, because what we tend to see within Whitehall is that there will be a small team within um, subject portfolio departments that deals with devolution, and then the rest sort of deals with what they think of as, as, as a UK issue. And if you were to sort of flip that on its head, as John suggests, I think that's, that's potentially really interesting. It would serve intergovernmental relations as well, because then it would make it easier to, to know when the UK government was acting for England and in its capacity as effectively a, govern, a, a government for England and when it was acting um, as the UK government acting for the union, as it were. Um, so I, I do think those white hole machinery aspects are key to um, reforming and improving um, the way that intergovernmental relations takes place. Now, we've had a big um, reform of the machinery of intergovernmental relations. It's not yet fully implemented. Um, obviously, there's been quite a bit of uh, political volatility uh, since that reform was introduced that, have, that has affected um, its introduction. The Senef actually just did some research, um, a review of how it is um, being implemented, and it seems to be a little patchy. Uh, I think the interministerial groups that are meeting regularly are groups of officials that would, and ministers that would have met regularly anyway, um, and more in the sort of DEFRA space where there were already very good working relationships. Some others appear to be um, not yet up and running. Um, so there's still a long ways to go in terms of the process, but I, I, I said at the time, and I still think that process has potential, um, but I think it's also about the culture and the practice and the attitudes that, that ministers bring from all of the uh, administrations and the extent to which there is a willingness to, to genuinely work together. Th thank you for that. In fact, interestingly, last week we had um, evidence from civil servants who talked about this, kind of the, this interrelationship between the culture uh, and the kind of system that you set up and um, the view that if you put the system in place, the culture will follow. Um, I, I don't know if you agree with that. And also, I was going to um, bring in uh, Akash Porn as well on this. Nicola, do you have a comment on, on culture? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I've, I've done lots of um, research interviews and lots of research around this, and I've lost count of the amount of times I've heard that phrase about it's the culture that matters. Now, I don't think that's unrelated to process. I think if you... So a lot of the, the way it was before, it was ad hoc, they often didn't meet. Um, whereas if you have a system that, in, that institutionalised regular interaction, then one hopes the ministers get to know each other, the officials get to know each other, they get used to working together. And one of the innovations of the new system was that, that it is designed to be less hierarchical. So it is... Uh, a little bit more of an equality of a relationship um, in these portfolio and the intermediary level. And so that should, in time, one hopes, help to build uh, some of the trust that has been eroded over recent years. Uh, and Akash, have you any comments on that or, or the wider question of intergovernmental relations? Yes, yeah, sure. So I, I, I agree that the, the, the conflation of English and UK functions in, in Westminster and Whitehall 
is the is the source of some of these problems. I mean, I think I'm uh, I, 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 I'm less um, convinced than than John that there's an easy solution to that when when, when you've got a, a state that has evolved over many centuries um, that is um, at its heart a kind of c c conflation of of UK and English matters. But I, I so, so I think in terms of big structural solutions, it's quite hard to to fix that. But I, I, I agree with the analysis of the problem. And the way I the way I think it it bleeds through into um a suboptimal IGR system is as I think both other witnesses have kind of uh, referred to. The UK government um I think yeah finds it difficult to differentiate between when it's engaging with the devolved administrations um, as the government of the UK, in which case a hierarchical relationship probably and, and attitude probably in some sense is appropriate. So when the Treasury is engaging with the devolved administrations about spending allocations or when the uh, Department for Trade is doing is, is, is involving devolved administrations in um, to feed into international trade negotiations. In that situation, which we are talking about a UK government um, consulting with and, and, and taking into account views from uh, subnational entities, but in other areas where the functions are fully devolved, we should be coming together, the four governments should be coming together more on the basis of equals. And I think the UK government, because it doesn't formally differentiate between its English and UK functions, finds it hard to make that adjustment. Um, it does vary, I think, quite a bit across uh, across departments. And, you know, there's been some good progress around the development of of common frameworks, for example, uh, which are supposed to operate and, and be, be agreed on the basis of, of consensus between uh, between the four nations. Um, but in terms of the operation of, of the intergovernmental relations machinery, as Nicola's just said, um, it does still tend to be quite uh, patchy and I think dependent on individual ministers and secretaries of state, the extent to which they they prioritise engagement with uh, with the devolved bodies, and and hence, yeah, you can you can see it just in terms of which uh, interministerial groups have been meeting. Yes, the DEFRA one, I think the education one, uh, the, the sports cabinet that DCMS run have been meeting. But in other areas, um, it seems like there's been no progress at all. I think health and welfare and um, justice, for example, as far as I can see, that they've not even established a, an interministerial group there. So, yeah, I think there's um, there's been progress made, but but there's certainly further to go. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Um, could I bring in Mr. Ruskell online, please? Yeah, thanks, convener. <clears throat> Thanks, Kavina. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to follow up on uh, those points around the, the, the culture, um, which was raised with us um, last week. Um, I mean, I suppose we've been quite focused in this inquiry looking at, you know, the formal consent mechanisms of steel. And we noticed in, in evidence that you've submitted that there are now uh, references to consultation um, entering into, I think, I think legislation. But I'm wondering to what extent there are good examples of where governments are working together on, on co-design. So going beyond just formal consent mechanisms, going beyond um, consultation, whatever form that might be, but in areas where there may actually be co-design or there has been co-design in, in the past. Um, so I, it, I'm, I'm not sure who would like, like to start with that. Um, Akash, you're on my screen at the moment, so yeah. maybe start with yourself. And we'll work backwards. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think I, th I think that's that's a a, a really important um, question. I mean, it's easy to get focused on on process and machinery and so on, but um, are there practical examples of of good joint working? I think I think there are some, um, even amidst um, relatively poor relationships at the kind of high political level. 
Um, and you can see, I mean, that the, the, the that there are now much more regular reports um, on intergovernmental relations. I mean, this is one of the ways in which things have improved, I think, following, and to some extent before the intergovernmental relations review, we now have quarterly IGR reports and annual reports. And, and those, if you look at them, contain some quite interesting case studies. So, I mean, just a few I, I noticed in some of the recent reports, um, certainly the UK and Welsh governments have worked together, it seems, on uh, agreeing um, on free port or the establishment of a free port in, in, in Wales. Um, there's, I think, progress being made with uh, green free port in Scotland as well. I believe the progress has been a bit slower, but that, that's quite an interesting area. Some of the, the city and growth deals um, have been essentially co-designed and, and co-funded. Um, and, and and I think represents a good practice as well. There's been collaboration, for example, around um, settlement of, of refugees or, or from uh, Ukraine, for example, the Homes for Ukraine scheme. Um, and, and certainly during COVID, there was a lot of uh, a good a lot of good joint working. So I think yeah, you can you can find a few areas like that um, that hopefully one one could build upon. I mean, on the other hand. Um, I think you know there's there's been less good practice around uh, funding for uh, leveling up the leveling up fund, the shared prosperity fund, the way the UK government has um, has has un unrolled uh, or rolled out those uh, in a way that kind of bypasses the devolved administrations is not ideal, and I think has led to kind of unhelpful duplication of of functions between central and, and devolved mm. government. But but yeah, it's not all. A bleak picture, in in my view. Okay, uh, John, can I can I bring you in as well? Yes, I, I just to add to Akash's point, and I, I just make the obvious obs observation that the examples that he gave were all, with the possible exception of Ukraine refugees, examples of where the UK government had decided on a priority which it wished to work with the devolved administration on. So free ports, I don't think were ever suggested by the Welsh government or the Scottish government. Uh, the desire to invest in city deals explicitly came from a UK government view that it should not respect the boundaries of the devolution settlement. And I, so I think that these, the areas where there has been cooperation should largely be understood where the UK government wishes to extend its remit, but actually needs in practice the engagement of the devolved administrations. Now, you can argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think that is quite different from a normal practice of co-design, which might cross boundaries in different ways. So one obvious area where lots of these problems were revealed in practice was COVID and issues of different public health strategies in the different nations. It took a long, long time there for people to really understand even the different powers that existed in different nations, let alone why people were taking different approaches. So whilst I agree these are signs that there are possible good working relationships, I think there's a difference between ones that are essentially top down from the UK government, which engage with the devolved administrations, and areas where people running England Wales and Scotland get together and say, we have a common problem. Let us discuss the different strategies by which we can, we, we can approach it. And that's where I think the culture and practice is more difficult, because without the sort of Whitehall reforms that I talked about, which I haven't think are much easier than people think, um, you don't have a set of civil servants who think of themselves as responsible for England, who can sit down with their colleagues from Wales and Scotland and say, what's our joint interest here? Mm -hmm. So would you say then that what Akash is, is describing there is more akin to how, say, the UK government would work with, um, you know, an English region, be it, a, 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 you know, a mayoral um, a set up or a, or, a, or, a, or a county council or, or a regional body in terms I think of it's... directing a priority and then seeking involvement in that policy? Yes, priority? I think almost certainly the devolved administrations have more say than an English region would do because because you have a constitutional authority uh, of a significant nature and therefore the UK government sensibly has to in engage with it. If you look at the process of free ports in England, 
there's really been very little engagement with the local authority view of those free ports. It's been much more about I mean, local authorities put in bids, but I think there's been, as far as I can see, much less negotiation about the nature of those, those free ports within England. So England suffers from a different type of centralization, though I would think that the examples that Akash has given are probably a much higher quality engagement with the Scottish and Welsh governments over the nature of free ports than has actually happened internally within England. Okay, thanks. Uh, Nicola? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what John has said there. Um, a, a lot of the examples um, are, going back to the point I made originally, um, a reflection of um, the UK government perhaps being more willing to um, engage in areas that are devolved, um, seeing itself both uh, as the UK government acting in reserve matters, but were legitimately um, acting for the whole of the UK on, on all matters and recognising the need to work with the devolved institutions on that. But you asked about co-design, and I think it, it, it does come a bit later, um, more in terms of, of, of implementation and, and rolling out rather than the original ideas generation. I don't think we're really seeing that, with the exception of common frameworks. Um, mm. The frameworks programme was um, a, a positive example of co-design, very much a, a, a for administration project, um, and led obviously by officials rather than rather than the ministers. Um, but even there, um, there was no a priori reason why common frameworks only had to be in areas of devolved competence. There are lots of areas of repatriated EU law uh, that mm. were in reserved areas that intersected with devolved responsibilities. It could have been that you developed common frameworks and common approaches um, in those areas too. But they didn't, and that, and that was a decision that was taken at the beginning. That this was about areas that were devolved. So I do th that, that it gets to the point about perhaps a different approach um, to, to devolution, in part created by the challenges of Brexit. So I'll just make one additional point, and I think um, Akash mentioned the, the increased transparency, um, and I think that is right. I, I, I agree with that. That um, one of the positives, um, particularly from the UK government and and the Welsh Government is that we've seen um, an increase in the reporting um, of what takes place in the intergovernmental arena. But the quarterly reports, they're, they're interesting, but they're a bit glossy, and you could be forgiven for thinking that everything was hunky-dory if you just took them at their, their, their face value. I think it masks um, some of the, the, the issues underlying. But one thing I did want to make is that the Scottish Government and the agreement that the Scottish Government had with the Scottish Parliament was pioneering in this sense, in that it, it did sort of push the issue of transparency up the agenda. Mm. Kind of seems to have fallen away a bit um, in, in the Scottish Government. I'm not really seeing, you know, the annual report. I haven't seen one for a number of years, so it's not really an annual report. Um, and yeah, I'm not quite sure where the, where the relationship is there with the Parliament in terms of scrutiny. Mm. Um, that was very useful. I just, it brings me on to the, the next topic, actually, I wanted to ask you about, which, which was about common frameworks and your impressions about how those are working at the moment. Um, we had some scrutiny this week in Parliament on the uh, waste and resources common framework, and it was very interesting listening to the civil servant from the Scottish Government, who he was explaining that this is a very evidence-based approach. Um, I wouldn't say it's completely politics free, but um, it feels like a very sort of iterative framework that is considering evidence on issues such as you know, exemptions around deposit return or single use plastics. But I wonder what your overall impressions are of, of common frameworks right now, whether there's enough transparency there and whether common frameworks are going to be put under pressure by individual issues that are coming out of the Internal Market Act or, or indeed the retained EU law bill. Um, Akash, should we start with, with yourself again? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of positive progress with common frameworks development. I mean, there's over 30, I think, published. Um, a lot of them are still listed as provisional, um, I note. So, 
they haven't fully been they haven't been fully finalized and implemented but i think they are um because they're quite technical um civil service driven um frameworks they are serving to i think facilitate quite a lot of interaction in a, in a slightly more structured way between between officials working in yeah these quite technical regulatory areas um to to with 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 um where there's a need for as you say uh information sharing evidence gathering um analysis of whether um rules brought in in one part of the uk might have negative effects elsewhere um i mean these are these are very complex questions that um i think will require quite a lot of ongoing attention um so it's not entirely clear yet um how they're going to interact with the with the uk internal market act going forward um i mean the idea of common frameworks as we've already discussed was of course that um through agreement and consensus um divergence would be would be managed and 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 common approaches would hopefully be the default but um by by agreement and um notification uh the 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 the, the the four nations might take different approaches um in 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 over time um obviously the the uk internal market act kind of cut across the whole common frameworks program um in in in, in creating the the market access principles that limits the scope for um effective divergence because um if 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 a product or service is is um able to be provided to consumers in one part of the uk um then all other parts of the uk have to um accept it within within their market so that is the is the kind of um hard law that's been brought in that i think does cut across the common frameworks program we've seen one exclusion agreed so far i believe uh to uk internal market act on on single use plastics um there's potential for that mechanism to be used more often um that again comes down to kind of political will uh willingness of of central government and ministers at westminster to to allow greater divergence following agreement through uh through the common frameworks process okay thank you um Nicola, can we go back to you on this and we'll move to John? Yeah, um, I mean, the interesting thing about the frameworks was the, the, the importance that um, particularly um, the devolved governments attached to the principles that underlay the frameworks programme, um, and in particular the principle of acknowledging policy divergence while enabling the functioning of the UK internal market. And I always thought that the, the principles were sufficiently ambiguous to get the players to work together, um, but were always going to be difficult to um, operate in practice. And I think we were probably starting to see that now. Um, it's difficult to tell because although we can, there's transparency around what the frameworks are, it's much more difficult to see how they're operating in practice. They did evolve. Um, I think at the outset, there was an expectation that these would um, lead to common regulatory approaches in a sense, um, whereas they're not that now in the main. They're, they're more about ways of working, ways of engagement. Um, and again, as Akash said, there's, there's been an attempt to sort of depoliticise um, these and make them quite technical, but the technical can very quickly become very political. Um, with single-use plastics exemption, that was interesting. Um, it, it, it revealed that there and, and it developed a process um, for agreeing to exemptions that could protect um, the authority of the devolved institutions to make um, public policy that had the same scope as it would have had prior to uh, the Internal Market Act. Um, but it slowed the process. Um, so even where that works, even where that mechanism works, it slows the pace of policy development and implementation. And um, so that is an effect um, on 
on devolution. And then we are hearing now um, the, the, the probability that a similar exemption uh, may not be permitted um, around deposit return schemes. So um, it's not clear um, how much that mechanism will, in fact, um, be utilised or, or permitted. There is a dispute resolution process within, the, within each framework. Um, but again, we're, we're talking time um, in, in terms of policy uh, development uh, and implementation. But I think the transparency issue is, is key here. Mm -hmm. Um, John, just finally, any any reflections from, well, from yourself Nicola, on this one? Nicola and Akash know far more about the current operation than I do. But if I go back to my thought experiment about doing devolution if the UK was outside the EU and you were starting from scratch, some of the differences you might see would be a more strategic approach to identifying the issues that needed to be dealt with through a common framework and a way that had political buy-in. Secondly, very much a four nations discussion about those issues in which England had its distinct voice. And thirdly, a sort of some sort of UK wide resolution or a disputes resolution procedure where it wasn't possible to agree, but probably operated in a way that incentivized people to find an agreement rather than to find a disagreement. So, in other words, avoiding the situation of a UK government Trump card always being played at the end of the discussions. So, I think that um, you can see how some of the discussions might work, but I think the way it would have been set up if you were trying to do this 20 years ago and knowing that there were all of these areas that you know, had been in the EU, which are now going to be disputed, it would be much more open, politi politically bought in and strategic than it seems to be at the moment. Thanks very much, Joe. Back to you, convener. Thank you very much. Can I bring in Mr. Golden, please? Thank you, convener. I thought we'd start with Professor Nicola McEwen. Um, but it's a question for the entire panel. I wonder to what extent you feel the Scottish Parliament's legislative and scrutiny function is being underutilised as a result of the powers retained by Scottish ministers in a post-Brexit environment? And to what extent do you feel the Scottish Parliament's role is or isn't evolving in a post-Brexit environment in its interactions with Scottish ministers? So I think, um, if I've understood the question correctly, um, I think that Scottish ministers and ministers in all of the administrations have, um, mostly through UK legislation, been given enormous powers um, to act um, in secondary legislation to do things at pace. And we've seen that in previous legislation. We are seeing it now um, with the rule um, legislation. Um, which has the potential, I mean, I'm sure we'll come on to talk about that because it has the potential to have an enormous impact um, on, on devolution and on regulatory standards. Um, but it's another example of where um, things are being done at pace without, I think, probably the sufficient scrutiny. And that's not a criticism of the scrutiny um, mechanisms in the Scottish Parliament. It's, it's a feature of time and the process and the tools that you are equipped with to, to engage in scrutiny sufficiently. And so I do think that is an issue, um, I, I guess, as well, in terms of um, the continuity legislation. Um, I think that's, that is one that originated within uh, the Scottish Parliament, and that too has given um, Scottish ministers um, a lot of uh, power um, that isn't subject to the usual uh, scrutiny uh, processes. Um, I'm, I'm not sure yet how that uh, is being exercised, um, but there are clearly capacity issues within the Scottish Parliament um, that might hamper your ability to, um, to scrutinise um, these processes effectively. There are also capacity issues within the Scottish Government that uh, in that might inhibit their ability to do the things that they are uh, empowered to do. And thanks for that. That's very helpful. Um, just to pick up on your last point, do you think it is um, largely down to capacity issues, or is there institutional mechanism reform that might be 
helpful in this regard, in addition to capacity? Um, that's a really good question. I think it's probably a bit of both. Personally, I think there should be more MSPs, but that's probably not going to fly. Um, but I think you're all stretched very thinly. Um, but I think um, I, I wouldn't. I, I'm not an advocate of a, a revising chamber um, in the Scottish Parliament, if that's kind of what you were what you were hinting at. I'm not deeply opposed to it either. I just think there are other ways um, that are perhaps more um, democratically. Um, accountable um, and I, I would like to see enhanced an enhanced committee system um, I think a, a lot of it is about resource um, but you also do a very good job so. <laughs> uh, thanks uh, I'm sure that comment was for the committee as a whole um, shall we uh, I can't see if anyone else on the panel wants to come in Any other comments? I, I'm not going to comment on how well the Scottish Parliament works. So that's way outside my expertise. Okay. I, 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 yeah. I likewise wouldn't comment on the, the scrutiny. That's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I likewise don't think I'll comment on, on how the Scottish Parliament does scrutiny. But what I would add is um, there is clearly a growing um, reliance on, on delegated legislation in, in, in many of the areas Nicola has mentioned. And I don't think, you know, that the UK Parliament necessarily, even with its much greater capacity, its much greater number of, of members across two houses, um, does a, you know, particularly forensic job of, of scrutinising all of it. It's, and it's not just about, so it's not just about capacity, it's, it's whether these often very technical pieces of legislation, but within which there may be some important regulatory changes, are the likely focus of attention for for, 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 for parliamentarians. Um, they're often not very um, politically salient, not the kind of issues that necessarily get uh, members of parliament um, press coverage and so on. So I, I do think a lot of a lot of this uh, delegated legislation does um, sail underneath the uh, underneath the radar, so to speak. Um, I mean, there's committees, of course, in, in Westminster that, that try to flag um, pieces of uh, statutory instruments and so on of, of particular constitutional significance. The House of Lords Delegated Powers Committee, I think, does a good job in that respect. But there's just a huge, huge mass of of legislation that um, there's, there's insufficient attention paid to in, in any part of the UK, in my view. Thanks for that. Thanks for that panel. Back to you, convener. Thank you. Um, Dr. Thank you. Uh, convener, um, it's interesting to, to hear um, some of your views. Uh, I think Professor Denham, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you're talking about how adjustment to the, the mechanisms for communications between the various governments may not be enough to to solve some of these problems. And, and certainly last week we heard from civil servants who were, or former civil servants who were, were commenting on, on some of the, 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 the causes of tension at the moment. Um, so we heard from Professor uh, Jim Gallagher, Director General, or former Ger Director General for Devolution at the Cabinet Office, who told us uh, that the UK Internal Market Act was a breach of the Sewell Convention. Uh, I wonder if any of you have a view on whether we should worry about that or whether um, the Sewell Convention is still real uh, and uh, functional. Well, I mean, I'll chip in, I'll repeat what I said earlier, so very briefly. We, we are talking about devolution outside the EU. Had we attempted to do devolution when the UK was already outside the EU, nobody would have invented the Sewell Convention because nobody would have believed that something as sort of inadequate, flexible, whatever, ambiguous as Sewell would have been adequate for resolving the disputes that would necessarily would arise in UK domestic policy uh, outside of the EU. So in that sense, if we, unless somebody thinks I'm wrong and everybody says, no, that would be fine, I, I, I don't believe we would have invented Sewell. So the idea that we can now make Sewell work in, a, in the context we're in, 
I think is mistaken. It doesn't mean you can't make it better, but you actually have to go back and say, let's suppose we've done the whole devolution thing already outside the EU. We wouldn't have invented the Sewell Convention. We would have had to address the different national interests that exist within the United Kingdom. We would have had to address the nature of the United Kingdom itself. And because we've done it sort of the other way around, we've come out of the EU, and, but we have an inheritance of an old devolution settlement. The temptation is to say, well, surely we can just make the devolution settlement work a bit better. That seems to me to be illogical. It's the natural political response. People shy away for all sorts of reasons from this more fundamental nature of the debate about a 21st century union. But ultimately, I would say to the committee, I think we have to confront that question. Otherwise, it's not necessarily that the union will fall apart. There's all sorts of issues involved in that. But if we want the union to be a happy, successful place in which we have got the right powers at the right level to tackle the many problems which we face, we're going to have to have these more fundamental discussions about the future of the union. That's absolutely what I, what I believe. Do the others wish to come in? If Professor McEwen, do you wish to come in? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, um, so the Seal Convention was the way to combine devolution with Westminster parliamentary sovereignty. Yeah. It was, it was Westminster's self-denying ordinance in that, yes, it remained the sovereign parliament, but it would um, not um, act in that way in those areas that were devolved without the consent of the devolved legislatures. Um, and that clearly only holds and only works so long as the practice is maintained. And what we've seen in the last few years is that in Brexit-related legislation, at least, um, it has not been maintained. And I think um, after the first time, it became easier um, to, to set aside um, the withholding of consent from the devolved um, institutions. And we've seen it on a number of occasions now. And I do think that erodes the authority um, of the devolved uh, legislatures. Um, I, I read um, the excellent paper that your advisor, Chris McCorkindale, provided uh, for you, which set out very clearly the array and bewildering array of different consent mechanisms that we have in place now. And I do think that is, that is a, a problem um, and a challenge. Um, and sometimes th there is a sort of ambiguity around what consent means now. Um, you know, from sort of something that looks more like consultation or, or seeking to, to get consent um, as to, uh, and then, you know, strong, more, strong, more strongly something that expects to secure um, that consent before acting. But none of them, none of them, um, even when Sewell was working in practice, um, amount to um, the kind of veto power that you might see in a federation. So none of them are giving the sort of constitutional protection um, to um, devolution and to devolved uh, authority to do that. I think you would have to uh, address um, parliamentary sovereignty. The Brown Commission report is interesting here. Um, there is a recognition of the problem and an attempt to resolve it. Um, although not going as far as, as changing uh, parliamentary sovereignty, um, but it does rely, um, I think, uh, my reading of it at least, is that it does rely very heavily on the much bigger reform of uh, changing the House of Lords and, and making it the sort of protector of the devolution settlements within uh, the UK Parliament. And I'm not sure... Um, whether that will happen anytime soon, um, such a big change. Uh, so I think it's it, short of that. There might need to be other ways um, to offer at least some procedural uh, protections, if not constitutional ones. Akash, do you wish to come in on this? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I would just add, I mean, the, the, the UK government, I think, would argue that it does still b respect or and, and want to preserve the Sewell Convention um, and that the cases where they've, they've legislated without consent have all been linked to Brexit 
and Brexit is a not normal situation, and the Seal Convention was always framed in terms of what should what should normally and not normally happen. Um, I mean, that's the line that has been taken. Um, I think it's 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 not a it's it's quite a um, tenuous argument. I think that argument did um, make some sense for the perhaps the original EU Withdrawal Act and the um, EU Withdrawal Agreement Act, where there was a need to to to, to, to pass the legislation, um, for example, to avoid No Deal Brexit at the end of the process and, and the government felt it had no alternative. But certainly with some of the other legislation that we've seen passed without consent, most, I, I would argue, um, egregiously the UK Internal Market Act, there's there's just been a policy decision really to, to push through legislation um, w without consent, the, the, the establishment of the UK minister's um, spending powers, the financial assistance uh, powers within the UK Internal Market Act. That wasn't necessitated by Brexit. That was just a decision the UK government took. So, um, yes, I think there has been a, a weakening of the protection to devolved autonomy that, that Sewell provides. Um, and it's led to lots of different proposals for what one might do about it. I mean, we've uh, produced a report at the Institute for Government that I think you've You've seen um, making some suggestions for procedural reforms, at least to give the consent process more visibility, more transparency to, to, to hold ministers more to account for decisions they take to um, to proceed without consent. Um, obviously, there's 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 options to go further than that um, in terms of trying to give uh, Sewell. Um, some form of, of of legal entrenchment that's of course very difficult to do within a framework of parliamentary sovereignty but um i think it's 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 good that that conversation is being had um here in scotland well in scotland and and certainly the the independent commission on the constitutional future of wales um is very concerned about this issue as well as as has been the welsh government for for several years um, so, so I think it's um, it's an important issue for the committee to consider. Uh, if I can come back, convener, uh, the other issue, perhaps of one of many strains, but one of the other strains that was uh, that came to the fore um, uh, in our evidence last week um, uh, was the issue of the retained EU law bill. So we had Philip Rycroft, former permanent secretary at the Department of Exiting the EU, who said of uh, the rule bill, frankly, words almost fail me in respect to this bill. It does seem to me it is setting out to do the impossible. It is an extraordinary piece of legislation and the one, one that we shall see very, very little benefit from. I wonder, can you comment um, on how you feel going forward in a world with a, a rule bill, the relationship has changed and what can be done um, to overcome some of the problems that some witnesses we've had have identified. Can I go to Nicola McEwen first, please? Um, that I haven't read um, the, the evidence from last week yet. Um, I'll read it with interest. Um, and I expect I would share many of the sentiments. I mean, I think... I mean, one thing that's really interesting is that all of the other things that we've been talking about, common frameworks, UK Internal Market Act, all of them are driven by the same concern, a concern to ensure that um, leaving the European Union didn't inadvertently create barriers to trade and mobility within the United Kingdom. So it was, and, and to some extent, all of the government supported that principle, if not always the, the operation of it. Um, the real bill is motivated by completely different concerns. It's, it's motivated by sovereignty. It's um, about ending um, the, the status and the supremacy of retained EU law. Um, but it, it will have enormous implications or potentially have enormous implications um, for devolution, potentially for regulatory standards. Um, there is a deregulatory assumption built into um, the bill in that burdens cannot increase, they can stay the same or they can decrease. Um, but there are enormous challenges on the devolved institutions. And there are enormous challenges on Whitehall. And the number of, there's almost 4,000 pieces of legislation that have been identified so far on the rural dashboard. 
um, around half of those, I think, are in the sort of DEFRA type space, which is heavily devolved. So um, we can expect that there um, will be um, hundreds, uh, at least, um, of pieces of legislation that are devolved. And it's really complex because sometimes you get bits of bills that are devolved and bits that are not. And then how much of a say will um, the Scottish Government, let alone the Scottish Parliament, have over what happens uh, to those regulations um, when everyone is having to act at pace to get this done by the end of this year. Um, and there is no sunset for the devolved institutions. Um, things may fall accidentally. Um, and I think that there are, it, it's creating a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of concern. Um, I saw the evidence, I think it was presented to your committee um, from the Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates, lots of concerns among the legal community. And um, so I, I think um, it's difficult to know what to do about that other than to continue to, to raise the issues. Um, and to continue to raise the devolution dimension there, because there isn't the capacity um, to uh, to even identify all of the pieces of legislation, let, a know, let alone know what to do with them in the time available. So I do think it has um, the, the potential to cut across a lot of the other things that we've been already been talking about. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in the first time. Could I just very briefly say that I, th I think the bill illustrates the difficulty of talking about Westminster sovereignty as a given, that we understand what Westminster sovereignty is and it's there, because Westminster sovereignty always relied on practice as well as the doctrine of sovereignty, and that required a respect for Parliament and its processes. And there is no model of Westminster sovereignty in modern history which provides ministers with the rights effectively to scrap or rewrite legislation without it going before Parliament. It really is in an unprecedented situation, and I think it illustrates the extent to which a simple understanding of Westminster sovereignty is now being interpreted by a particular government as a right to remove Parliament from the process of making the laws under which we are governed. So even, leave, even if there, we didn't have the capacity issues and the devolution issues that Nicola has mentioned, it is quite impossible to justify this approach to undertaking legislation. So I think in terms of the wider constitution debate, it really highlights the fact that there isn't a common and shared understanding of what West Westminster sovereignty means. And what follows from that is we don't have to keep blocking our thoughts about constitutional change by saying we can't do that because of sovereignty of Westminster. Uh, there are all sorts of models of sovereignty which are available to us uh, which would be democratic, which would enable the union to function. And in a sense, this appalling piece of legislation illustrates why we cannot simply go on saying, but we have West Westminster sovereignty and we can't do anything about it. We can reimagine it if we wish to do so. Mr. Pon? I don't have anything to add on, on that particular issue. Um, Okay, that's, Thank you. that's fine. Thank you. Um, can I invite Ms Minto, please? Thank you, Convener, and, and thank you, um, panel, for uh, this has been really informative. Professor Denham, if, if I could turn to you first. Um, I read your paper on um, setting up an, an English um, parliament with great interest, because I always reflect back to the West Lothian question, and I appreciate that you were um, in government uh, when uh, Scotland uh, achieved its <coughs> devolution. So I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts, based on your paper, of the improvements that an English uh, parliament could mean for the currently devolved nations. Okay, thank you. And what I'll hope is reasonably clear from the paper is that my proposal was not initially for a separate English parliament, but for a form of English votes for English laws within Westminster. I mean, partly because I don't think the English would vote to set up another set of politicians uh, at any time in the conceivable future. Next question. <laughs> the, practic the practical effect of requiring MPs in England to look at English domestic legislation as a national question, 
rather than as a sort of subset of UK policy, if accompanied by the establishment of the sort of machinery of English national government at civil service level and the proper reflection of that in ministerial, in ministerial responsibilities, would, I think, taken together, start this process of disaggregating English domestic issues from the Union as a whole and therefore enabling political and governmental debate across the United Kingdom to focus on those issues that we share in common and where we would wish to uh, work together. But it's a process sort of unpicking um, the, com the, the confusion, the conflation of England and the UK, which I think would be very valuable indeed. Um, there is, uh, historically, and you will be aware of this, I'm sure, what many people, including myself, called Anglo-centric British unionism, which is a long-standing sort of English view of the union in which the union is really England writ large. And there's also always been this asymmetric view where Scotland and Wales had a different view of what the union was about and Northern Ireland another one again. And in, there, it, part of the political challenge is, in a sense, to challenge that lazy Anglo-centric view of the union, which is all too common in the conduct of politics and government and the media and academia within England. So I think the big benefit actually is that by having a clearer focus on England and a clearer distinction between English interests and union-wide interests, we would both get better union-wide policy that was more respectful of the different interests of different nations and England itself would come out with a clearer sense of its own interests and its own uh, good governance. Thank you. Um, would any of the other panel members like to comment on that? I would agree that there's, I don't think, much desire among the English public for a, a fully separate English parliament and English and, and English um, administration, so I, I certainly don't think we're going to end up with a, a any sort of federal settlement um, in in the near or, or, or indeed medium term. Um, I think there is a case, as as John's laid out, for resurrecting some form of, of English votes for English laws. It was tried in a fairly low key, watered down form that didn't really make much difference and was barely noticed either inside or outside Westminster. Um, so certainly if in future we end up with a, a parliament where there's a different majority in England compared to across the UK as a whole, I think that issue, the West Lothian question, as you've referred to, could, um, could, could become relevant again and then some version of, of what John has, has suggested might well make sense, along with that um, reflection within the within government of, of which functions are England only, which are which are UK wide. So yes, I, I agree with I agree with quite a lot of that. I mean, I I do think though that the the primary problem facing England is less that English interests are subsumed into the state and more that England is is over centralized and that that leads to poor governance poor policy decision make uh, decisions and um, a center that's overburdened and, and trying to do much too too much and and doing it poorly as a result so um, I know that's something that that John would agree with as well I suppose that would be my primary a concern, though, um, is that if we're, one were to end up with a separate English government and parliament, um, would that be more likely or less likely to um, solve the problem of over-centralisation within England? Um, I mean, I have a view that it might worsen the problem because then um, that those new England-wide institutions would be inclined to to, 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 to hoard power at the expense of regions, mayors, local government, and so on within England. Okay. I know John would probably take a different view. Well, of I mean, 
just you not haven't come here to talk about devolution within England, but but briefly, it is the absence of a coherent machinery of government for England which makes devolution within England so difficult, because there is no joining up between government departments at a Whitehall level. So. All we see of devolution is tightly controlled by the Treasury and doesn't join up different government departments. So Akash and I just take a different view of the, the dynamics of this. I, I actually see coherent English government good for the union, but also essential to unlocking devolution within England. Within England. We shall see what happens in the years ahead. Thank you. If, if I may, um, I, we took evidence two weeks ago um, from the Constitution Committee and from the House of Lords. And one of the issues that was brought up was the use of secondary legislation. Now, um, it's been touched upon, um, I think, in my colleague Mr Golden's question. Um, and I'm interested to hear about the thoughts um, of um, on Baroness Drake's statement that she said that um, it's constitutionally dubious to begin to use secondary legislation more and more to intervene in devolved legislation. Um, and then she went on to say that where secondary legislation is used, there should still be consent sought. Now, we've already had a bit of a discussion about consent and what that means. I'd like to hear um, panel's views on that. Perhaps start with um, Professor McEwen. Um, I would agree with her. Um, again, I haven't read her evidence to your committee um, and will do so with interest, but from the extract that you read out, um, Yes, I, I think I think that's absolutely right. And there's always been a, a even when Sue was working, there was always a bit of ambiguity about uh, whether it extended in Scotland to secondary legislation. It did in, in Wales, um, but it was more ambiguous in Scotland. Um, so I think that's it's perhaps worth highlighting and pushing um, on that as a committee. Um, in light, I mean, there's an issue of whether there should be this much secondary legislation anyway. Um, I don't think there should, but there is. Um, but given that context, it may be worth pushing as a committee to ensure that Sewell, um, or a version of Sewell, and a version of consent that works for you, um, is part of that process, because this absolutely should be um, subject to scrutiny. And I think, I think that's perhaps in the rule bill process because of the capacity issues, it may well be the case that the UK government takes a lot of this on, um, on behalf of the devolved institutions, given the time constraints available. And I know there's a lot of intergovernmental working uh, around this, um, so, but there's an issue of whether the government's consent, and then there's a whole other issue of whether Parliament gets a role in that, and I think Parliament absolutely should get a role in that um, for the purposes of democratic accountability. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to comment? Well, in principle, I, I think it's, it's, it's hard to argue with the idea that the, 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 the consent um, should be the, the expectation for secondary legislation, at least as much as it is for, uh, for primary legislation, where UK government Ministers are, are taking decisions that um, relate to devolved competences, um, and I think the point has been well made by, by witnesses today, and certainly in the some of the papers produced for the committee that we have this growth of different kinds of con consent and consult uh, mechanisms established in law. Some some are just you know by convention. Uh, some are kind of binding consent requirements, others are just you must seek consent and then within a month um, the government at Westminster can proceed regardless, um, which is, I think, definitely not, not ideal um, to have this quite important constitutional principle interpreted in such different ways in different legislation. So anything that can be done to bring a bit more uh, consistency and clarity to that, I think, would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Okay, um, I'm just moving to Miss Boyack, please. Thanks very much, convener. Um, just want to reflect on the the conversation we've had today. Um, the the principle of the top down versus co-design 
<coughs> way of government. Um, and that's come across today and the, the need to change post-Brexit because what was a convention is now being kind of swept under the carpet. So it's thinking about both short term, what are the solutions to try and change that? Um, and then longer term, what would be the solutions? And I'm kind of interested because there's underpinning this, there's also a kind of centralization issue, um, which comes out in some of the evidence we've had. Um, um, Professor Denham, you've talked about the issue of accountability in an English context and in terms of ministers. Um, but is there, is there not also an interesting issue about centralisation? Um, certainly looking at the House of Lords, vast majority of Lords are London based and, and we have similar tensions in Scotland about centralisation. So is there an issue about that moving away from what we have now, um, which Jim Gallagher nicely summed up as constitutional carelessness last week and actually refreshing how accountability works in the UK, in the House of Commons, um, the accountability we have and you know what would be your short term priorities and then maybe more longer term. I'll kick off with you first of all, John Denham, and I'll, I'll work around the other witnesses. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, and it's a very good question. My my short term measures, i.e. within the first term of a, of a of a Westminster Parliament, would undoubtedly to begin this process of delineating the government of England from the government structures of the United Kingdom and beginning to move towards more of a four nations approach to collaboration on union wide issues and maybe to begin to institute some of the changes in the House of Commons that have I've uh, outlined and then at the same time uh, because Akash and I agree on this to bring about a very significant devolution of power within England. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important is that local government actually assumes its own constitutional autonomy and protection within certainly the way in which England is governed. I think there's a very interesting question and it's probably the sort of thing that should be discussed across the union if you wanted to give a tier of local government constitutional autonomy and protection in, in England and, for example, looking at how, how it's resourced, its rights to raise finance, things of that sort, is that a principle for England? Is that a principle that would want to, to see right across the United Kingdom? Couldn't legislate for it right across the United Kingdom without undoing the devolution settlement, but it seems to me that that's a very useful constitutional debate that ought to be had right across the United Kingdom and not simply be one in which we say uh, we're only interested in one place. Now, actually doing something about it might require uh, voluntarism on behalf of devolved nations. It might happen at different stages, but if I would highlight that as the sort of issue which in the, in the longer term we should properly be discussing, I think that would be an important one. I, I think you're absolutely right that the state has become very, very centralised, and this is obviously particularly true in England. I mean, I, you know, the sort of biggest devolutions in deals in England which were announced yesterday are nowhere near the powers of Hampshire County Council that I was elected to in 1981. There has been an extraordinary centralisation of power and also a removal of whole areas of service provision from democratic accountability. I, I think that is a debate that is a devolved issue, but is probably the sort of thing that in a working United Kingdom, where we wanted to make sure that we had power at the right level, right across the United Kingdom, we should also be having on a union-wide union uh, level. Okay, thank you. Um, and Akash, did you have a view on um, how we embed a more decentralist approach, um, moving decision-making out of Whitehall? towards local communities, as well as to our devolved parliaments and institutions? Yes, well, I, as, as, as I uh, said a few minutes ago, I think, I, I, I absolutely think that over-centralisation is perhaps the central problem uh, facing England. I think it leads to poorer governance. Um, it contributes to continued regional inequality, it means we don't get the benefits of devolution in terms of scope for tailoring policy and to local needs and testing out new approaches, the sort of policy laboratory idea. Um, and you end up with a, a central government trying to, to do too much. 
um, that it's not best place to to do. Um, I, I think in, within England, um, you know, there's been some progress made towards uh, decentralisation. Um, doesn't go as far as 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 um, I would like yet, but I think the announcements yesterday for Greater Manchester and West Midlands um, are quite a, a potentially transformational step um, in terms of freeing those regions to control public spending on some quite important areas within their within their regions. So, I mean, I would like to see a continuation, an extension of that process within England, uh, devolution to cities, city regions and county councils. Um, that's something that both parties are committed to. Um, it seems so. Uh, I, I expect that process will continue. Um, within Scotland, um, that's, of course, a matter for for the Scottish Parliament. I, I wouldn't be in favour of um, some of the, well, there's been in, in some way um, a, attempts by central, by, by the UK government to bypass the devolved institutions in Edinburgh and negotiate funding arrangements directly with local councils in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. I, I don't think that's constitutional, constitutionally appropriate, frankly. I think it's a matter for Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government. Um, but my impression is Scotland also is and has become too centralised, um, and that too doesn't lead to um, the best policy outcomes. So it's, 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 a, it's an area where I would certainly like to see uh, future Scottish uh, governments um, decentralising to, to, to local councils as well. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting in terms of both the revenue raising at a local level, what powers they have, and I was also thinking about the kind of cross-UK issues, where if you look at energy production, for example, there's intergovernmental issues, which we don't see addressed. The UK government sets the legislative framework and the um, management framework in terms of the grid. The Scottish Parliament and the um, devolved parliaments have significant powers over renewables and then at the local level it's actually the councils that have to get on and do the, the heavy lifting so there's interesting issues about intergovernment work that shouldn't just be seen as parliamentary. Um, in terms of the comments um, that you made earlier um, Nicola McEwen do you have a, a kind of short term and a, a longer term issue of um, what needs fixed? You've mentioned Sewell a lot and that's been a lot of our evidence but um, your, your priorities for the short term fix and then maybe the, the longer term issues that need to be addressed? So, Sewell would be one of them. I, I think there are some things that can be done in the short term and then some things um, echoing John Denham's point that would require much bigger longer term um, reforms um, and restructuring of, of the union state. Um, going Building on what the exchange that you just had with Akash there, um, one of the things I wanted to note was this idea of shared rule that we've talked a lot about over the last few years, but I think is sometimes misunderstood because it's come to sort of mean setting up systems and processes over areas that are devolved. But actually what it means um, in sort of political science terms is about having mechanisms in place for where um, let's say, um, devolved governments can help to shape and influence those areas like energy policy where they don't necessarily have the competence but are affected by it. So it's, the, it's at the intersection of what's devolved and what's reserved. And we just don't have that, or we don't have it much. We have it a little bit in some of the interministerial groups around trade, for example, um, but I'd like to see a lot more of that in the areas that are reserved, but that affect things that are devolved. So more of that joint working in that space in the way that it has there has been focus on joint working in devolved areas. That's at the UK devolved intergovernmental space, but I think there is a lot to be done also in the Scottish local government intergovernmental space because some of the 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 um, the satisfaction and the grievances that the devolved governments have in the, in the Scottish Government has in its relationship with the UK Government, um, you see some similar dynamics within 
Scottish government, local government relationships within Scotland as well. And I think that's an area that I would like to see um, the Parliament um, and the government uh, address in the years to come. So about empowering um, local authorities. I think the fiscal capacity issues are important uh, that you already mentioned. And that's not something that requires action on the part of the UK government. It's something that can be done uh, within, within Scotland. I Thanks. I, I picked that up as well from the Welsh uh, constitutional work that that's going on, which is not just about more powers for the Welsh government and changing the parliament, but also relationships with local government, which that centralisation agenda, which we kicked off with John Denham today, feels quite a powerful one in terms of how governments work. Um, and that sent, you know, the people at the centre, that's their view of the world rather than a more consultative approach. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could, could okay. I convene and just add a short point? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I, I just thought the question of energy is a fascinating one because it does illustrate the extent to which we've often separated the debate between devolution in terms of powers and autonomy from the debate about effective public policy. And energy is clearly an issue where, from a UK point of view, we need powers operated coherently and collaboratively at numerous different levels uh, for the UK government internationally, at the level of nations, at the level of localities. And unless the right powers are both at the right levels, but secondly, we have ways of having collaboration over those operations, we will never have the optimum output. And it is, I think, been, has been striking over the last 20 years how almost the debate about devolution of powers or not has become separated from the debate about the achievement of effective government outcomes. And I think the example of energy is a very, very good one of those, which could be extended to a number of other major policy areas. That's very helpful. About things like community wealth building, municipal ownership of energy, but also how the grid works. So there's something about best practice, but also potentially about whether the actual framework suits different parts of the UK, both in a uh, sub-national sense, but also geographically, different opportunities. And I think that's something that um, a more cross-government at a UK um, devolved nations, but also local level, would actually, in terms of tackling the climate emergency, is something that doesn't feel to have the political support that really could make the big difference we need. That's where the, the combination of culture and practice come in, because collaboration is partly about how people work together, as well as the formal powers for which they're responsible. And if you don't get that right, the formal distribution of powers won't produce the outcomes that we want. Yeah, thank you. Are there any further questions from the committee? I wonder if I could just ask a final question um, in relation to... Um, some of the aspects of what we talked about um, uh, and the importance of intergovernmental relationships, but also um, the direction of the, 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 the government in Westminster. In terms of rule, um, we haven't been able to find a, a single voice in favour of rule. Anyone who thinks it's a good idea, except from you know a small cohort within the ruling government at, in Westminster at the moment. Um, and. But obviously there, there are genuine concerns out there um, uh, constitutionally and we don't know what the impact of the new um, Windsor um, agreement will have on the relationships with Northern Ireland who, who again are in a completely different um, position to, to Scotland and Wales at the moment. So I just wonder if, if, if where you think the, the pressure will come to, to make a change in this, is it absolutely about personalities and relationships? Um, will it take a change of government? Or do you think that there's a, a mechanism that, um, looking to um, John McFall's concerns that we're sleepwalking into executive power um, in the UK, possibly, um, where do you think the, the, the political pressure and, and the civic pressure will come um, as, the, as these tensions continue over time? I can maybe go to um, Professor Denham first. It's... I think the civic pressure, if it comes, will come largely around environmental standards and labour standards and protections being removed. There is already a, a very big movement uh, of concern about the dumping of sewage uh, 
in rivers and seas. Uh, it's become a major public issue, including in what would be regarded as a whole swathe of marginal constituencies. Um, this is largely taking place outside formal party politics. Um, it's very much grassroots mobilization. And you can see that if rule leads to clear indications of other standards, and this is happening within the existing <laughs> regulations, but if this is happening in other areas, I think it could become politically very difficult for the government between now and the general election. We've got a government now after some turmoil which seems anxious to try to close down as many areas of civic contention as possible. And I think there's a that's where the issue is likely to come to a head. Um, if somebody's interested in constitutional issues, you'd love to say it was about the principle of Henry VIII's clauses and executive rule. I'm not sure it's directly going to come up in that way. I think it's as people become aware of the potential practical consequences that you're likely to see a reaction. That's from my perspective here in England, at least. Mr. Pong? Yes. Um, I mean, I, I agree with that. I, th I think the, the retained EU law bill is it's, it's, of, it's of symbolic importance to, to the government and, you know, a certain uh, section of, of the Conservative Party to be seen to sweeping away the last vestiges of, of EU law from the UK statute book. It's, 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 it has that, um, that, that, as I say, kind of symbolic sense of, of, of finishing the finishing the job, um, and yet, I guess as as you said, it's hard to find many people pointing to the specific practical benefits that this will will bring about. I mean, there is a, a wing of the the Conservative Party and um, its coalition of support who probably would favour. Um, you know, radical deregulation of environmental and labour standards and and other things. Um, but I don't think that's where, you know, the, the, the majority of um, its support lies. And I don't think that's where why most people voted for Brexit in England. Um, so I suspect that if it does lead to watering down of some of these important standards, um, in ways that, that people weren't expecting, uh, we will start to see that that resistance that that, that John has just spoken about. Um, and in the meantime, it's just going to be a very time-consuming, complex process um, for government and uh, and and the governments of the UK in general. Um, for I'm not entirely sure what what benefit. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor McEwen? Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Um, it, if, if the rule bill is purely about the symbolism, so if it sort of keeps everything the same, um, then at worst it is a drain on resource and a swallowing up of time um, that could have been spent on other things, but might in the end not change regulatory standards. But the risk is, of course, that um, a it does without it does change standards without sufficient scrutiny, and b it changes them by accident because there wasn't the time um, or the the awareness of regulations that were in place within the time that is available um, to to address them to 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 take the actions that the rule bill um, allows. Um, so I, I, now I fear the latter, but, it will, but it's all so complex and it's all ch changing so much that I think it's quite difficult to politicise in a way that raises that awareness. It will take a political party or a movement uh, to channel um, to channel that to, to get to the point of the sewage um, in the waters to regulatory change in 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 Westminster or, or wherever um, to to turn that into a sort of bigger political issue, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we're quite connecting the dots yet. Okay, I'm going to thank 
all of the panel for their attendance this morning. Um, it will help us indeed in our inquiry going forward. Uh, I'm minded of someone asking for directions and being told, well, I wouldn't start from here. And I think that's where we're all kind of feeling about this at the moment. But thank you very much for your attendance. And on that note, I'm going to move into private session for our final agenda items. <laughs>